that was pretty good. We did a good job on that. Well, I kind of ran into a, a, a question mark. From, you know what? I don't know why I'm laughing. This, this getting old isn't for sissies. D just trying to remember, you know, and, and I used to laugh about that. You walk in a room and think, why did I come in here? And then you laugh about it. It's not a laughing matter anymore because I, I walk in the room, I can't remember why I came in, and I go out and I can't remember why I went out. So I, so I uh, worked on this message, put it together for an evening service. It uh, might be some of a challenge. And I was going through it about the third time around. I'm thinking, boy, this is looking awful familiar. So if you've heard this before, please don't tell me. Just leave the room and don't say anything. Uh, hopefully it was uh, some years ago. <laughs> I thought I was just putting together a new message. But it's over here in 2 Corinthians 13. I have a booklet that I printed uh, when I was printing ministry uh, some years ago. And uh, one of those books was... Uh, I, I can't remember the title of it, but in every, Paul wrote 17 books, is that right? Uh, 14, 17. In every book, at the last few verses, he gave some interesting thoughts just to the church that he'd been writing to, but also to carry over for us in the Bible. And he, this one is titled, Four Lasting Positions. Look at 2 Corinthians, the last chapter, the last couple of verses. Chapter 13, beginning at verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. And that's the text. Then he went on to say, greet one another with an holy kiss. Now, we don't really do that one <laughs> in our day. All the saints salute you. That's behind him, the people that are with him. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. That's his signature. Verse 14, in each of his books, I personally think he wrote Hebrews, but he didn't end Hebrews with this kind of a verse. So, But here, in that one verse, verse number 11, he names four lasting positions. We've been saved lots of years, haven't we? Uh, I got saved in uh, December 11, 19. Uh, 58, uh, put the years together, that's an awful lot of years, and others had also been saved a long time, and if you looked at all the things we've learned, and all the things that we've, do you like this word, inculcated into our lives, these are some of the things. If you take everything you wrote in First and Second Corinthians, you could make this the final verse for both, for both books. Finally, brethren, and, and the, the word uh, finally here is as of now. Everything here is behind us. And so as of now, from henceforth, from what you learned there, you're going to do now four things. So it actually has two parts to it. One is a farewell. Finally, brethren, that's this. Farewell. You, at a certain point, uh, his head was taken off and there were no more letters. But even this one, farewell, I'm telling you goodbye. But with what I've told you, from here on, here are four things you ought to do. Four lasting positions that ought to be in your life and mine because we know this book and we know the First Corinthians book as well. And here's the outline. The first position is before God. You're, you're standing there, this is why I remember standing here looking up. You're looking up to God, the Heavenly Father, and you're before God, the first two words, be perfect. You can't do that with me, and I can't do that with you. The only place because of the grace of God that someone can see you perfect is God the Father looking back at you. So before God, be perfect. Then drop down a ways to number two. The second one is before ourselves. This is the in-house bunch, and if nothing else, you, yourself, and I, for you to see before yourself, be of good comfort. Well, we have so many folks today that are just torn up with problems and worries, and our government isn't helping anything. The changes that are being brought upon us, before God, be perfect. 
but before others, in spite of all the circumstances, be of good comfort. And then number three, before those within, be of one mind. Now we're right here. We're here. We're with the folks that were here this morning that can't seem to get it. I, I get uh, feedback from them that they watch the service. I'd rather folks should come back. Uh, it's too easy to sit on a couch and have your slippers on and your hair and rollers. Or, and that's the husband. No, I'm teasing. Uh, then to get up and get dressed and come to church. It's what we've always done. And you have a testimony that you owe me and that you owe these folks. And we have a testimony that we owe you. Before those within, be of one mind. Man, we're supposed to think alike. And then the fourth one is before those without. Now you have the world. Boy, so much of what Paul wrote in First and Second Corinthians, most of his books had to do with our testimony to those without. And look at it. Live in peace. If you're going to be have peace anywhere, do it around those that are unsaved. I like the one verse we'll look at later. He said, as much as in, in you, <laughs> as much as is in you, live peaceably with all men. <laughs> He's allowed for the fact that sometimes it isn't in you to do that, but do it anyway. Uh, before those without, live at peace. Father, I thank you for these closing thoughts that come from Paul. And this is summary. He's taking everything that he taught us and making us responsible for these four positions that we received from these two books. Bless the message, encourage our hearts that we could have this fourfold testimony around us and in us, through us, and in all the other places that we would be, we would carry these four things in our testimony. Bless the message. I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, look at number one. Uh, finally, brethren, farewell. While you're at it, number one, be perfect. And so, and immediately you have to say, I, I can't do that. You can before God because God sees you cleansed by the blood. There's more to it than that. But God doesn't see you in sin. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. And if he doesn't hear me, he's dead sure you're not going to look at me. So my position with him is cleansed by the blood. And so before God, be perfect. I can't do that with you. And, and I couldn't lie about it because Joyce is sitting back there. I have to admit, she's been home about, uh, what now, three days? And boy, we haven't had one fight. We haven't even raised her. No, I guess I did raise my voice a little this afternoon. But it was in fun. <laughs> uh, no, the only place you can get this is because you're saved by grace through faith is this way. Before God, you know, if Paul taught you anything in here, don't disappoint God. Don't, don't have God look down and say, man, you faked it for a while, but now you're back to your usual self. Before God, we should strive to be perfect. Now, I stuck that word in there. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. Matthew chapter 5, and this will give us the explanation of what this word perfect is all about. Because you know and I know you may be saved by grace, but a saved person can do anything an unsaved person can do if they want to walk in the flesh and not in the spirit. But if you do that, you won't appear perfect before God. Here it is in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now that made the matter even worse. What's our example? God the Father. This is not a mirror. I had that old mule collar mirror in my office. I didn't see God in that mirror. I saw me with all of my shortcomings and with things I needed to bring to the throne of grace. Say, preacher, why'd you have a mule collar with a mirror in it? So I could stand there and look at it in it and say, Lord, it's me. And that's what the mirror was all about. And I could have a little bench in front of it. I could get on my knees and confess my sin and try to put myself in a position. And here's the verb tense in this verse. Be ye being perfect. 
You're not there. Uh, say, will I ever get there? Yeah, it's called the rapture. And even at death, you leave this body, you leave Adam behind, and you can stand in the presence of God. But you're on this earth right now, and the body is Adam's, not God's. And the things that I would, I do not. And the things that I do, Paul said, uh, I, that I don't do. Well, anyhow, he said, I do the one, and I don't do the other. He said, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now our modern scholars say, well, that's Paul talking about himself before he got saved. Are you kidding me? That Paul would have no reason to write about that. Once you get saved, all that is gone. And now you're responsible for what you have as a born-again Christian. And of all things, you better have a personal relationship with God. And to do that, you have to be working at it. Be ye being perfect. Striving to do the best that you can. Well, look at some of the verses that go with that. First Peter 1.14. For we won't look out too many verses because I'm still having trouble turning these pages in my new Bible. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 14 and, uh, through 16 says this, And as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy, in all manner of conversation. Now remember, that Greek word conversation is manner of life. It's not, not talking about a Gary and I having a conversation. This word conversation is not that. This word conversation is your manner of life. So in your manner of life, you should be striving to show God. Uh, verse 16 said, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So now we're back to the same thing again. Ephesians 4.12. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 12. I'm almost there. Uh, there I am. Ephesians, Philippians, there we go. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 12. This is talking about uh, preachers and their calling. But the application of it goes beyond the pastor. Every Christian should be striving for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what a church does. Man, you walk into a church where God is on the throne and Jesus is Lord in our lives. The singing has it. The fellowship, the atmosphere is there. Boy, the difference. I look back over the years. I've only pastored two churches. The first one, 18 years, and I've been here 21 years as pastor of the church. I was actually here eight months before that as interim pastor. And then we ended up taking the church. But boy, you look at the difference between that day and this day. Woo! You walked in and when folks sang, you could see the rafters moving up and down. You could sense the presence of the Spirit of God. Folks that came in unsaved, most of the time left getting saved. Trusting Christ at an old-fashioned altar. What a joy that was. Counselors would come and pray, and then they'd step to the side, both men and women. And as folks came to get saved, having watched in the, the auditorium and seeing God working in hearts, I would see some lady and I'd think, you know, my wife would do well with her, so I could turn motion to her or take that one. And to some of the men, take this fella. And they'd bring them right down the altar and get on their knees. And sometimes we didn't get out till 1, 1.30. I never heard anybody except somebody who would put a roast in the oven ever complain. And my, afterwards, then we took the cards, and I'd, I'd question each person for the decision they made. And you know what? No one ever was offended by that. Try that today. You hard enough time to get people to come anyway. But we could get offended over the least of things when we, we should be putting away the old man and showing our holiness of before God. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And I'll be done with this point. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's see, that's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There we go. And verse number 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, uh, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Watch it. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
one of the things that makes you strive to want to be like God is the fear that you won't. It's the fear that you'll fail him. It's not the fear that God's going to beat you with a stick or uh, something really bad is going to happen to you. That fear is your fear. You fear failing God. And the person who does that is being made, be ye being holy. And you can look at yourself and say, you know, how often do we ever do this? You know what? I'm closer to the Lord today than I was last year. You know what? I, I've drawn closer. I, I know the presence. Oh, here's one. I know the presence of the Holy Spirit today more than I knew it a year ago. Here's one that's so pragmatic. I know the songs better now than I knew them years ago. You realize how many songs you sing that you've never really caught the message? And sometimes when the Lord's really working on you, especially in these areas, you're singing a song and all of a sudden the words hit you. They're for you. That's this before God. Be perfect. Of course you're not. You're, you're perfect before God because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's own son, has cleansed you from all sin. Now live up to it. How many people walk into church, haven't read a Bible, haven't looked at a verse, haven't witnessed to one soul, couldn't even find their Bible before they got here, and then want to walk in and play holy? There's no game here. Man, what you're doing, you are responsible to God for. Notice number two, going back to our uh, text again, I didn't uh, put a marker in there, did I? Uh, where am I? Second Corinthians 13, let me move my marker over here. Oh, I do have it in there, okay. Notice the second one. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. That's before God. And then number two, be of good comfort. That's before ourselves. You're supposed to have peace in your heart before the Lord with the life that you're living. And that's kind of what motivates the perfection on the other side. But you ought to have peace in your heart. Be of good comfort. How many times did Paul end the book saying, be of good, that was his signature, be of good comfort. I have a tax man that lives in Fort Collins. He's been my tax man for over 40 years, and he's a born-again Christian, loves the Lord, and I just got a text from him for his monthly newsletter, and he signed the letter, be of good comfort. He's forever doing that. So when I answer him back, I usually add something else that Paul said with the good comfort, and he always gets a, a real kick out of that. Are, are you at peace with who you are and what you are? Look at chapter 1 in 2 Corinthians, verse 3 and 4. Same book, started out with these two verses. Verses 3 and 4, I'm getting there uh, to chapter 1. There it is right there. Uh, at verse 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, look at it, and the God of all comfort. Oh, that's not the end. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are also are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. <gasps> Five times in one verse he used the word comfort. You think maybe that would indicate this is important? God gave it to Jesus. Can you imagine being on the cross of Calvary and, and in that beginning, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's no comfort in those words. That, by the way, is a rhetorical question. He didn't have to answer it. Just by looking at him, God watched him take all your sin and mine and of the whole world upon himself. And that's why God couldn't look at him. God looked at him. God, being a pure eye, cannot look on sin will not regard iniquity. God turned his back on his own son for four hours and wouldn't even look at him while he paid the price of the sin of the world. And if you want to see that, read where it's originally quoted for him in Psalm, uh, where am I at? Uh, Psalm 21 or 22, 21. And read verse 6. He said those words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In verse 6 he said the answer, Because I'm a worm, the word worm is tolots, uh, not a worm, it's a particular kind of worm. And, and he likened himself, this is David talking, but the text is Christ's words. I have become the tolabug, 
That's the bug that, the worm that Lydia, the seller of purple, went down by the riverside early in the morning and collected them into wet grass and put them in a bowl and took them back to her shop and took a pestle and crushed the, uh, the in, in a pestle with the, uh, the, the uh, whatever that, the, the thing that would crush them. Then she would strain that off so all the ingredient was gone. And the only thing left was the blood and the estreedment from the tola. And you know what it is? It's bright red and it's indelible. And Lydia, the seller of purple, could only use that tola bug's juice for robes of royalty. You think the Bible doesn't give you some good stuff? She collected that. You didn't get that robe. She then, however, she diluted it with pure water. And she put robes of royalty in that and let them dry. And that's what you wear. You're clothed in the robes of royalty that Jesus produced on Calvary. And that's why God can see you. And that's where Jesus got his comfort. He said to his father, Father, it is finished. And he bowed down his head and gave up the ghost. Why? Because he had the comfort of what he was doing. And that's what you're supposed to have is the comfort of God in your heart. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And twice in that text, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Receive the comfort that I'm offering to you. And here it is. Who has it? You do. I do, we're supposed to have it, and I'm supposed to be able to see it in you, and you're supposed to be able to see it in me. And boy, listen, the last thing I ever want in a conversation with you is for you to bring up your lost side and of what you used to be and do it in a glorifying sense. Man, I'll tell you what, I don't have one thing that I could glory in, save in the precious blood of the Lamb, and I don't want you to see that other side of me. Is it still there? Sure, it's still there. Man, one night, I always tell the same story. Guy cut me off down here at 44th and, and uh, Youngfield. And I was in the turn lane, he cut me off. And man, I slammed on the brake and put my hand over to keep Joyce from hitting the windshield. And I came loose on that guy. I said, you stupid fool, if I had the time, I'd drive you off the road and take you out of that car. And Joyce said, before or after you prayed. <laughs> oh, I hate it when she does things like that. But that's what I was doing. And where were we coming? To church. And so I'm going to walk in later and say, bless things on you, my children. No, I'd never say that. Your comfort better be coming from the Lord. Peace I leave you. My peace I leave you. Not as the world giveth, Jesus said, giveth I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid. The comfort that we receive from the Lord. Ah, uh, there's another verse there, Second Corinthians 7, 4, but we'll not turn there. Number three, our lasting position. Finally, brethren, the book's complete. You got all the lessons. Now here's what you're supposed to have learned, that you should look like this in four ways. When you stand before God, you should look perfect. When you stand before others, you should demonstrate comfort. And then the third one, before those within, that's the church. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, that's a part of the very small part of the church. I haven't had anybody ask me yet, uh, are, are you going to keep having evening services? Sure we are. Long as you come, say, what if we quit coming? Joyce, uh, I haven't had an opportunity just to preach to her for a long time. So who knows, one of these days I may end up there, but we'll be here preaching the word and having the testimony uh, to those within. And to them, be of one mind. Look at it in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Philippians, Corinthians, we'll go over a couple of works here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Wow, what a challenge we pick up. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, and be ye like-minded, 
having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Uh, verse number five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So he becomes our illustration of this. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but nevertheless made himself of no reputation. He could have. He said, think not that I couldn't call 6,000, uh, six legions, uh, 10,000 angels, the song says. We ought to sing that way. He could have called 10,000 angels to reprove the world and set him free, but he didn't. Look what he did. He made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. With all of that, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our lasting position among all of us. Imagine if the day did come. Boy, I'm scared of some things that are going on. Suppose, you know it'll be war. Suppose the man in the White House, who now has colored the White House, L-G-B-T-Q-M-N-O-P-Q, striped with lights at night, and flying under the American flag is the flag of homosexuals. You know, suppose he gets a law passed that we can no longer buy ammunition, we can no longer un, uh, own rifles. I got a paper a couple of years ago. It said uh, in a tax thing, it showed a, a picture of a house. It said, identify the rooms that you keep weapons in and where those weapons are. I ripped it up, threw it in the trash, waiting for the day to call me. They tested that. I don't think anybody followed up on it. But suppose that happened. It can't, it can't be. If it does, there'll be war. You'll be on the Lord's side, or you will have let 1920 turn you into a COVID-19 sheep, and you'll want to do what the government wants you to do, but there'll be a whole bunch of us from within that'll be of one mind, and we'll stand for Christ, and you're one of them. You will stand for the Lord. That's what we were saved to do. And no matter what it costs, if you want to know what's going to cost, when was the last time you read Hebrews 11? Did you know in Hebrews 11 there are 40 individuals and circumstances that are mentioned receiving the trials and, and, and the testings of their faith? That's not by accident. There are actually 40 there. And 40 is the number of trial and, and your testimony. And they're, they're named by name, a bunch of them, but many of them are named by groups of people and, and circumstances. You go through and count them, and each one of them you're responsible for. You're supposed to be able to stand and be sawn asunder. You know what that is? They bring two horses back and tie them to your arms and bring them together, and then they say, yeah, and you're torn asunder, ripped in half, your arms and your body torn apart. You're supposed to be able to take that. There are 40 of them in that chapter, and that's the hall of fame of what our forefathers were like. And that's us, the testimony we have within. Boy, when COVID hit us, I couldn't believe it. The people that walked out, people that had responsibility to God, not to me, quit all their jobs. 17 people walked out the door. This is not a big enough church to have 17 workers walk out. You know, and it's taken us a year to get most of them back until we have a day like today. And no, oh, no, I'm pretty sure I can't make it today. And we fall apart. You know, we have to, we're supposed to have this testimony within that we think alike. I gave you the Ephesians 4. Uh, I gave you verse 13, uh, Ephesians 4. Let me show you verse number 16 with it. Uh, let me get back the other way. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, and we and it said in, uh, well, actually, we'll take 4 and we'll take 13 and 16. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, that's generic, men could be said there, a perfect group of people, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 16 goes with it for whom the whole body 
fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body and the edifying of itself in love. If I hand out a piece of paper tonight and ask you to explain that verse, I wouldn't get two papers back that would be alike. But I'll explain it to you. I had a man in my church. I had his funeral here. Uh, I'll come up with his name in a minute. Uh, he was a mechanic, and he flew to, uh, to Hawaii to fix an engine on a great big jet. He was an engine, jet engine. And while he was there, he was watching people body surfing. So when he got a little time off, he went out to do body surfing. He didn't know what he was doing. He got on the front of that wave, too far on the front of that wave. When it collapsed, he buried him head first in the sand, flipped him over backwards, and broke his neck. He had no body use below his neck. Everything uh, had been taken away. Now, I had a personal illustration uh, to tell about him being of one mind. Now, I forgot what it was. Uh, this is a fellow that stepped out of the, the areas that he was familiar with and thought, you know, I'll try that. And you, with that, in a wheelchair, uh, with his wife having to push him around, they finally got him a deal he could put in his mouth and, and blow and, and run that. Uh, he would come here for church. And you know what? He stayed with the Lord through the whole thing. My, I looked at that. And they had one on Facebook yesterday. It showed a woman holding her husband. Did anybody see that? Holding her, him on her back. He had no legs from the knees down. And he had one arm around her and the other hand waving. Said uh, he lost his legs in Iran or Iraq somewhere. And when they want to go somewhere where it isn't convenient with prosthesis, she carries him on her back. What, what, what a picture from within. This lady holding her husband up and carrying him. That man who could do about anything lost everything and riding in a wheelchair and can't make a, can't sing, but while we're preaching, he could nod his head. He could move back and forth. He could blow in and out of that straw and, and make things on that chair work. He never, ever gave up on God. And that's what we're supposed to be. And the illustration I was going to give here, before all that happened to him, he was a car mechanic. One day I was talking to him, and he had a, a truck bearing in his hand. It's that big around. And it was sitting in his hand. I was talking to him. He reached in a pan, and he pulled out grease and began to stuff it in that bearing. While I'm talking to him, he just keep. pretty soon he's got almost the whole can stuffed inside that bearing. You can see it. It's all over his hands and everything. And while we're talking, he began to do this. And you saw it here in this verse. The fitly framed together is called kneading. He kneaded, and I, I just stood there watching. And after a while, all the grease was gone. His hands, he still had grease on him, but the bulk of that grease was in that bearing. He kneaded it in place. Now look at the verse again. From which the whole body fitly framed together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love before others. Be of one mind. Man, we think alike. We believe this Bible is the word of God. We sing the old songs because they have the messages. We demonstrate fellowship because that's what godly people do. All of these are found before those within. And then lastly, before those without, he said, live, uh, live in, uh, let me find it here again. Be of one mind. Live in peace. That's before those without. That's not an easy thing to do today. We're having things that are tearing our police departments up, taking away their funding. People actually want towns with no police. The last place you want to move right now would be Seattle, Washington. You talk about a torn up mess in some of our other major cities. They've done away with the police forces. If police are there, if they're called to a place, they're not allowed to take a weapon with them. They're, they're made to go and, and read from a book what they can do for... Uh, you know, and, and they wonder why all the police are quitting, partly over money, because they're not going to pay them anymore. 
the kind of wages they deserve, and partly over the fact that you can't defend yourself. Sure as you do, the paper will pick it up, and you'll lose your job. You may even go to jail, some of them, and be put in prison because you were doing your job. That's from without, and as, boy, I know it's hard, as much as is possible, live peaceably with all men. Romans 12, 17, I'm almost done. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 17. And I want 18 with it. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of men. It is, if, or if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. <laughs> if, if it's possible. Uh, the another verse said, quit ye like men. Uh, and I thought the word quit meant give up. And that word means steal. Stand firm like a man before those that are without. Keep your testimony for Christ. We could say things like learn to count ten. Learn to turn the other cheek. Learn if they need your coat, give them your cloak. Learn if they want you to carry their pack a mile, carry it two miles. And, and those things are the testimony we have before those that were in, without, as much as it possible. Here's how you do it. This will be the last verse, Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25, and I'm almost there. There it is, 19, 22, 25. There it is, right there. And I want verse 21 and 22. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. <laughs> I like verse 22. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. <laughs> Sometimes those things are hard to do, but that's how you please God. You don't please yourself before those that are without. As much as is possible, live peaceably with all men. Oh, there are a number of other verses here. It, it takes us to the place of making a decision between Contending for the faith, now watch the words, or being contentious in the faith. I have a pastor friend, I count him a friend, he's been in four churches in the last five years. And every one of them comes because of contention. Somebody will say something he doesn't like and, and he covers it from here. No, no, that's not allowed. You can't do that. No preacher in his right mind wants to do that. Uh, he would do other things and pretty soon church would vote him out. Another church had called him, and you watched the pattern. And after about the same amount of time, he voted out. And then another one. And the one he said, now I watch him doing all the things that he did before. I don't know how long it takes for the guy to say, you know, the only thing common to all of this is me. <laughs> and, and then look around and find some things that he could change. And if we could learn to be, to contend for the faith and not be contentious. Man, don't be a troublemaker. Don't, tr don't thrive in doing things that upset everybody. We're not to be like that. Our testimony's lost the minute we do that. Well, I got some things going on in right now. My old flesh wants to do something to a guy that's messing up around here. But I can't do that. I have to maintain the testimony that the Lord gave us and uh, toward those who are without it. Boy, sometimes... It's hard to speak a kind word to someone that's done some of the stuff this guy's done to our building. We saw, Dave and I saw him the other day. He walked across our parking lot, and I think those were my coveralls that were stolen out of the building. They were all ripped up. They're hanging behind him. He didn't even have any shoes on. And he's walking on all that gravel out there. And, oh, saddest looking man I ever saw. But we have a camera. We got pictures of him. He walked through the bedding out here around the flowers to get his feet. Uh, he had shoes on, all muddy. Then he walked over on that green carpet and, and cleaned his feet all over the carpet. The, the hangers for our flags are on the wall. He's seen in there ripping one of them and he managed to rip it off. So when I had one flag that we flew on Memorial Day and I gotta get that fixed before the 4th of July. Always doing things like that. Be that as it may, you cannot return kind for kind before those that are without live in peace and so we try to make things work 
Contend for the faith, yes, but don't be contentious. Did you catch the four? Before God, do you see yourself, not you, but Christ in you, that God sees you five ways down through that? He sees you perfect. And then the second one, before ourselves, we're comfortable. I'm comfortable with who I am and what I am, and I like living for the Lord. I like to take the words of Popeye. I don't have a pipe in my mouth, but Popeye says, I am what I am. And that's what you are. But be what you are, they will honor the Lord. And then those who are within, let's be friends, man. Let's love each other. That's how you grow a church, and we're, we're not doing real well with that. But then toward the unsaved, those that spite us, those that say bad things, as much as is in you, live in peace with those that are without. Father, and these are four good positions, and I think most of all about number one, I want a good testimony before thee. Uh, be ye being made perfect. We know the only thing will fix that is when we get to go home. But until that time, we ought to have a testimony that you're pleased with. Help us to walk in love, to walk in light, and to walk in line circumspectly. And that walk will give us the peace before the throne of grace. Thank you for these four positions. Help us to fill them in the right way. And we'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take your hymnals and return to number 276. I don't think we've sung this one here for an invitation song, but that's what it is, 276. Where he leads me, I will follow. There are four leadings there. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. And you got four to be reminded of as you go out this week. Well, we're still not doing prayer meeting. I'm hoping to get something going on that here pretty soon. If you have some spare time and you'd want to do some work around here, we have quite a bit that needs to be done. Uh, most of it's outside. Uh, David and Sandra did the entire parking lot all the way around with weed spray, just the two of them. I don't know that anyone else asked or anyone else came, but I'll tell you what, those folks are precious workers. <laughs> the things they get done, and I missed them this week. So pray for them for journey mercies as they come home. Uh, we're, we're at the point now where you shake hands. We don't have any restrictions on us that anybody's trying to enforce, so be friendly. Shake hands and give me.